Today we're going to ask a question, when is 128 bits of encryption 128 bits of encryption? What does that mean? Is that good? Right? You know, will a quantum computer affect this? It was only a few years ago, it used to say military grade. I mean, we're all using military grade encryption very much so. Um, if you're using 256 bit AES, it's slightly more military than, than, than 128. But if you're using 128, don't feel bad, you're still doing absolutely fine. On a very, very simple level, for a symmetric cipher, that is a cipher where um, we use the same key for both encryption and decryption. So we're not talking about public key right now. What we usually mean when we say 128 bit is the length of the key. We don't tend to talk about block size particularly. So 128 bit AES is uh, AES with 128 bit key. You also have 192 and 256 bit variants of AES. They have the same block size, but the key gets longer, right? And the number of rounds changes. The reason we talk about the key length particularly is because if the cipher is good, the key is a bit you don't know. The key is a bit you're going to have to guess. So for a 128 bit block cipher, you might have to brute force through two to the power of 128 different keys. That's a lot of keys. You might get lucky, you might get it halfway through, in which case it's two to the 127. But either way, it's not a picnic. Right? That is years and years and years of work. Right? Much too much work, even for the world's fastest supercomputer. Because two to 128 is a lot bigger than you think. Right? This only gets harder if we make these keys bigger. So two to the 192 operations, or two to the 256, which is a number so unimaginably large that let's just not even worry about it. If your encryption is using a key, that's two to 256 long, and there isn't another issue with your cipher, right? so that the, the security base is based entirely on the key, then that is not brute forceable in, a, in any sense, within the next 10 years, within the next 30 years. It's good for us if that is the case. So which of these should we use? Well, I mean, intuitively, 256 bit, right? But actually, 128 bit is currently out of reach of any attacks. But it's always a slightly more complicated than this. What we also talk about is maybe the security of an algorithm itself. Maybe there's something in the algorithm that isn't quite as secure as the key itself. So maybe it wouldn't take two to the 128 operations to solve it. Let's say I've written a cipher that's got a 128 bit key. It may not have 128 bits of security, which is to say it would take this many operations to solve. And that might be because my cipher is not very good. Maybe it doesn't mix up things enough or it doesn't permute enough. Well, I don't know. Um, I designed it. It's not going to be very good. So you might find that an attack or a break on something like AES what it's doing is not telling me how to solve that problem, it's just reducing this number. So maybe there's an attack on AES that brings it from 2 to the 128 down to 2 to the 125, or something like that. Now that is many times faster than that, but still totally out of reach. Right? So that is what I would call an academic break, which is to say um, we've technically found a weakness in the underlying algorithm, but it's not a weakness that affects me in my everyday life, which arguably is what I care about most. So we want to distinguish between the bit length of the key. So when we say we've got 128 bit AES, we're referring to the key, but actually the level of security could be slightly lower depending on the algorithm. I mean, to use a really obvious example, let's imagine I have an algorithm that just appends the key to the message, doesn't do any encryption at all, right? That has a security of zero bits. Right, because it doesn't encrypt anything. But it does have a nice 128-bit key for what it's worth. Right? Not a very good example. You get the idea. If you've got some fundamental weaknesses in your cipher, it's not going to take a full brute force to do it. Brute force is the absolute worst case for an attacker. Now, this is slightly more confusing for public key cryptography. So things like RSA and Diffie-Hellman. Right? Because they tend to have much, much bigger keys. So a typical Diffie-Hellman or RSA key is going to be somewhere between 2048, 3072, or 4096 bits. These are your common sizes. Now, to factor and solve the RSA problem for a 3000-bit key, it's roughly the same as brute forcing a 128-bit good symmetric cipher. Right? So those numbers are obviously not even close to the same. So the security margin in some sense of these is lower for a given key length. Right? One of the reasons that elliptic curves are so popular is they get us a little bit closer from here to here. So an elliptic curve of 256 bits is going to be roughly equivalent to security of 128 bit AES or 3072 bit RSA. Now that's going to be quite a lot faster to compute. So it's no longer about the length of the key in terms of bits, it's about how many bits of security are we going to get. And that means essentially two to the how many operations are we going to have to brute force through to guess or work out what's going on. So how good 
is 128 bit or 192 or 256 bit and their equivalents. Well, two to the 128 bits is beyond any computer on earth that exists. But what, you know, it's, it's the obvious question, all the comments I know, it's thinking, coming, it's coming. What yeah. about the new advent of quantum computing? Quantum computing, right. So one thing that's to make really clear about quantum computers is they are not simply a very fast, regular computer. You don't just run AES on a quantum computer much faster than you would do on a normal computer, right, and make your life easier. You have specific algorithms that do specific jobs, and the algorithm that makes breaking AES easier is called Grover's algorithm. It takes this, hypothetically, from 2 to the 128 to 2 to the 64. Now, 2 to the 64 is within reach. So if a quantum computer exists that can break AES using Grover's algorithm, you're going to go from 128-bit security to 64-bit security. That is a problem, right? If you go from 256-bit security to 2 to the 128, that's less of a problem because I already just said that was beyond reach of any computer, right? So Symmetric is very resistant to quantum computers because all it does is halve the key space and we can just double the key space, right? Does this quantum computer exist? No. Will it exist soon? Not for at least 20, 25 years, is what Robert told me when we asked him. I mean, I have no idea. Right? I don't develop these computers, but certainly not any time soon. So public key cryptography, like this 3000-bit RSA key, for example, that is much more affected by quantum computers. Shaw's algorithm will basically make this as trivial on a quantum computer as just encrypting using RSA would be on a regular computer. That's not what you want, right? So if a giant quantum computer appears that can halve this problem, that same quantum computer could theoretically completely destroy RSA encryption. And then we're falling back on password-based key derivation functions and symmetric encryption, right? That would be the first thing. But there are cryptographers and mathematicians looking to create quantum resistant versions of public key algorithms of which some have been developed, right? So the chances are by the time such a machine exists, we won't be using these because of the fact that they have this inherent weakness, right? But I mean, to be clear, the, they have not factored anywhere close to a 3000 bit number with a quantum computer yet, right? There's questions about whether that's possible because of just the scale of the thing. But even if it is, it's not gonna happen tomorrow. Right. I mean, it would be quite amusing if it did, and my video is panned as being horribly out of date a day after release. But this isn't going to happen anytime soon. But the good news from our point of view is we're still going to get 2 to the 128 bits of security from AES256, which is why that's what's recommended for sort of long-term security for sort of 30 plus years. Right. Let's say I'm encrypting my credit card details and sending them off to an online shop. That credit card will have expired in two years. So it is a, honestly zero interest to me if you break my credit card details after that card has been expired. Right? I mean, you're welcome, go, go. If you're a government or the NSA or GCHQ or someone who has top secret documents that need to last for over 30 years, then you should be worrying about whether you use 2 to the 120 or 2 to the 256. You'll find actually if you go online, based on my sort of quick looking around, most websites use 128 bit AS. Banks and stuff are using 256. I still, I mean, arguably that isn't necessary right now, but there's no real reason for them not to, right? It's not that much slower. The idea is that these qubits can interact. This guy can interact with this guy, this guy can interact with this guy, and these can interact with one another. And every time we add a qubit, if we were to add a circle here, let's say we added this fourth qubit right here, we notice that every single one of them can now interact with it. We have to draw lots of these lines.